Uh, I don't know that there will be students this time. Hi, hello everyone. Welcome back to the MLSIS seminar. Um, we're super, super excited to have Dan, um, which is very special because Dan is the creator and longtime host of the seminar. Um, it's re re like received thousands of followers at this point, tens of thousands, and really kudos to Dan for building this community. Um, Dan is a PhD student in the computer science department at Stanford, uh, where he is co-advised by Chris Ray and Kayvon Badahalian. He works on research at the intersection of systems and machine learning and focuses on developing algorithms and architectures to make machine learning more efficient. Um, he's done a ton of exciting work. Um, he's a lab mate of both Michael, who's here with us today co-hosting, and myself, um, great collaborator, and we're super excited for him to be able to share some of the work he's been doing um, with all of you. So take it away, Dan. Cool. Uh, we also have Piero back. So those of you yes. who've been watching for a while will remember um, uh, also one of the original founders of, of the seminar. Um, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you all can see that. Cool. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. So my name is Dan. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some new ideas we have in developing kind of fundamentally more efficient um, architectures that are subquadratic and sequencing the model dimension. Um, and this is going to cover kind of two papers, uh, Monarch Mixer uh, and Time Permitting Flash FFT Comp, um, both of which we released in the past, uh, you know, few months. All right, so let's take a look at kind of the broader machine learning landscape and talk about a little bit why we wanted to do this work. Um, so over the past few years, foundation models have really been scaling in a couple of huge ways. So one way they've been scaling is that they've been scaling in model size. So they've gone from 100 million parameters to 500 billion and a trillion plus in four years. Uh, this has enabled, you know, some pretty crazy new capabilities uh, like human-like chat systems, the ability to write code for you, the ability to analyze complex text and, under and understand it. But they've also been scaling in sequence length. So this, this, this graph is actually slightly out of date, but in just two years, they've gone from, you know, 512 sequence length to, to 100,000. That now allows you to, you can now upload entire PDFs to OpenAI or, or um, or Anthropic and have it analyze a whole PDF, you can maybe start to learn from a whole book. Um, in computer vision, medical settings, long context means high resolution imaging. Now, this scaling has actually been a pretty expensive endeavor, and that's because, you know, our current models scale quadratically in both uh, model dimension and sequence length, and that's due to the MLP layers for the model dimension and sequence length and attention. Um, so as we scale these two axes, uh, things start growing quadratically. And if you remember, you know, your, your basic, you know, computer science, quadratic scaling can be quite expensive. Um, so ideally, uh, so here, that's that blue line. Ideally, we could get to three halves or something like n log n. Now, before I get into that, you know, one kind of uh, argument for, for kind of keeping the way things are is we could just say, okay, we can keep going. Um, let's just get more flops. Let's just scale up our current architectures as much as we can. This is kind of the open AI, Microsoft, dump a bunch of money into the solution type of thing. Now, of course, one challenge with that is it's going to be very expensive. But another challenge is that, you know, whether it's by just the sheer cost or the cost of, you know, putting together a giant data center with a bunch of strong interconnect or, you know, just executive order, um, we may we may start seeing the limits of this pretty soon. Today, today I want to kind of pose a different question, which is, is there a better way? Could we could we do something um, that's not just, you know, this this cartoon general flop saying we need more flops? And in particular, the question I'm going to ask in today's talk is can we find a single primitive that scales subquadratically to replace both the MLP and the attention layers uh, in these models? And as you might guess, by the way, I posed the question, uh, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, and the key is going to be this primitive called Monarch Matrices. So I'm going to talk about Monarch Mixer. It's a new subquadratic hardware efficient architecture that scales subquadratically in context length and model dimension. Uh, it can match bird vision transformer quality with up to 50% fewer flops, faster wall clock times. Um, and we also have some very early results for long sequence retrieval with, with M2 bird. 
Time permitting, I'll also talk about Flash FFT Conf, where we take the basic primitive, the Monarch matrix behind the Monarch mixer, and we're going to use it to speed up long convolutions on GPUs. So uh, as a challenge, in order to do a lot of those kind of long context reasoning, you need to use the FFT, but that gives you very low hardware utilization. So in Flash FFT Conf, we map the FFT onto tensor cores, reduce the IO with kernel fusion, uh, kind of using this Monarch decomposition. See up to 7.9 times speed up over, you know, FFT convolutions, much more over attention. Uh, up to 62% flop utilization end to end for context. Our fastest transformers are currently at 72%. So we're pretty close to the ceiling of how fast we can get. All right, so first for the for the Monarch Mixer part of the talk, that part will be kind of split into four pieces. First, I'll talk about some background on Monarch matrices. Then I'll talk about how we can use Monarch matrices to build these sub-quadratic architectures. I'll go over a family of architectures that we call Monarch Mixer, and then I'll go over some future directions that we're particularly excited about. So let's start with that background on Monarch matrices. So as a motivation for, for what a monarch matrix is, so a machine learning model is really just a bunch of different matrix multiplications. So there's this core building block, this major, sorry, this matrix vector multiply operation um, that is kind of all throughout machine learning models. You know, from one analysis from MLSS 2021, uh, you know, 99.8% of the flops in your transformer is matrix vector multiply, 61% of the total runtime. So a natural question when you have this one operation that kind of takes up so much compute is how can we reduce the cost of that? And a natural approach is kind of to use sparsity. So instead of using these dense matrix, uh, these dense matrices for these matrix vector multiply, you just say, okay, all my weights are going to have a bunch of zeros, and then we can just skip all those zeros, reduce the flops. Now, this sparsity, this kind of naive sparsity that I've shown you has a couple challenges. So the first is quality. So when you make a bunch of these entries zero, you kind of hit a efficiency quality trade-off. And one way you can think about that is if I make a bunch of this, a uh, bunch of the entries in my matrix zero, what operations can I still get? Am I, you know, fundamentally losing, you know, key, key things that I want to do? The other thing is that is, is due to hardware trends. So and due to hardware trends, dense matrix matrix multiply is much faster than general operations. So on A100, H100, excuse me, matrix matrix multiplication is up to 16 times faster than general, uh, than, than general you know, floating point operations. So monarch matrices are a way to kind of get the benefits of sparsity while addressing both of both of these problems. So monarch matrices, they're kind of defined here. They're defined as uh, you know, block diagonal matrices interleaved with these transpose permutations. They're subquadratic. So if you make those blocks small enough, you can get to something like n to the three halves. Uh, they're hardware efficient um, and they're expressive. And I'll kind of go over these points more, um, more shortly. So first subquadratic, and that's really just because these are block diagonal matrices. So what is being shown here is that the dark blue means that those are you know, free learnable parameters and the light blue are all zeros. So you can just skip all those zeros in the computation. If you set those sub blocks uh, correctly, you can get to something that has n to the three halves or n to the four thirds um, in, in compute. They're also really hardware friendly because you have these kind of dense blocks that are part of your block sparse matrix. You can just kind of rip them out. Um, and then those dense blocks can now use the dense matrix matrix multiply unit uh, that, that is so prevalent in today's GPUs. Lastly, these transpose permutations mimic kind of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. And, and to see what I mean by that, we'll, we'll walk through what those transportations do now. So what a transpose permutation does basically is, let's say you have some input, some 1D vector input. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to take that 1D input, reshape it to be two-dimensional, transpose that two-dimensional matrix, and then flatten it back out. So if you're a database person, if you're a systems minded person, you're taking some data that is laid out row major and just kind of reading it column major or, or vice versa. And turns out this super simple operation actually generalizes the fast Fourier transform. So, so to, to, to go over that, recall first that the Fourier transform is a linear map. It takes some signal, some signal in time and kind of uh, translates it into frequency space. So the, the thing about a Fourier transform is if you just write it out like this as a matrix, that's going to be a quadratic algorithm. But because this matrix, as you can kind of imagine, is so structured, you can get a nice n log n algorithm. So this is, you know, these are algorithms that have been around since, uh, you know, since since mid twentieth century um, and have been kind of widely known since then. 
And because, you know, there's this powerful, you know, uh, way to take this general operation and do it in N log N time, there's tons of applications in signal processing controls and a lot more. Um, you know, in, in one quote, people say that the FFT is the most important numerical algorithm of our lifetime. And it certainly seems to also be the case in machine learning. So what a monarch matrix does is it kind of generalizes the fast Fourier transform algorithm. So to see that, I'll walk over, I'll walk through it, you know, one formulation of the FFT, and then we'll see how the monarch matrix generalizes that. So this is a the basic uh, a basic formulation of the FFT. This is a formulation um, known as Bailey's algorithm for the FFT, and it kind of uh, operates in these four or five steps. So first, you're going to take a 1D input, and you're going to reshape it to 2D, which you know is the same thing that you do uh, in a, it's the first step of a transpose permutation. Then you're going to compute the FFT over just the columns of that 2D matrix. You're going to multiply by some factors that we call twiddle factors. These are just kind of a correctional factor. Then you're going to compute the FFT over the rows of that 2D matrix. And then finally, you're just going to transpose the output. So let's walk through exactly how the monarch matrix exactly captures this general computation pattern. And just for reference, I've put up, you know, from that first slide, our, our nine element vector from, from the previous slide laid out in 2D. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do this uh, transpose permutation. So we're going to take this thing that's laid out in row major, uh, read in column major. Then we're going to do the block diagonal multiplication. So what this is going to do, if you if you look closely, uh, is each of the blocks in that block diagonal matrix are kind of going to go uh, to, to one contiguous chunk of that matrix. So that first block will go to element 0, 3, 6, then 1, 4, 7, and so on. Now, if you look closely, these blocks are exactly operating over the columns of our 2D matrix. So I've highlighted that on the left over there. Then you're going to do another permutation to go from column major back to row major, uh, do another block diagonal uh, you know, uh, multiplication. And this time, notice that those blocks are exactly operating over the rows of our original 2D matrix. Finally, we're going to do one more permutation to exactly transpose it. So if you look closely at what we've done here, so we have one block diagonal operation that is exactly operating over the columns, then another block diagonal that's exactly operating over the rows. So those columns exactly match kind of step two of the FFT algorithm. The rows exactly match step four. Uh, you can think of those twiddles as we just multiplied them in, uh, kind of rolled them into those block diagonal matrices. So because these permutations in the monarch matrices generalize this super powerful fast Fourier transform algorithm, they're also super expressive. So the monarch matrices can capture many structured linear transforms. Um, I've just you know put a bunch uh, on the screen here. One that I'll note in particular is the convolution. Uh, the, the monarch matrices can in particular capture convolutions. And that will be important for when we go and take these architectures and replace transformers. All right, so uh, so now we'll we'll go back to exactly why we care about these monarch matrices, and really the question is, can we use them to scale subquadratically model dimension and sequence length? So can we take these monarch matrices, replace the MLP, replace the attention, get something that is much more efficient? And we'll talk about how we do that now. So first, the MLP. So this is relatively simple. Uh, here I visualize kind of you know a dense MLP. Those these are these red blocks on the left. Uh, you can just directly replace them with monarch matrices or block diagonal matrices. You get something that is hardware efficient and subquadratic. <clears throat> um, so this has been used to great effect before in kind of sparse to dense training, where you uh, where you use these block sparse uh, matrices for for most of the training run, and then switch over to dense at the end. Um, so this was done at some work that appeared at Neurops last year. Uh, now, the, the other question is, how can we use these monarch matrices to replace attention? Um, and here we're going to lean on some work that's come out of our lab, but also a, a number of collaborators recently um, uh, in, in showing that gated convolutions can start to match attention. Really what's happening there is you're taking kind of, you know, some projections of your input, computing some convolutions over them, and then these dots in these circles, these are gates, or they're just, you know, element-wise multiplication. So we're going to take those vectors, multiply them together. Turns out when you do this, you can start to match attention quality in downstream training for models that are trained on the same amount of data. Now, recall a couple slides ago, I told you, um, so, uh, oh, sorry, let's see, uh, sorry, different version of the slides. Um, so in particular, some of these convolutions are going to be computed with the FFT convolution. Um, so if you think about in your head, the, the 
the way that you compute the convolution is taught by kind of PyTorch um, that's still quadratic. But what we're going to do is we're going to use an FFT convolution to compute this convolution in n log n time. And as you might guess, this is going to come back at the end of the talk with flash FFT conv. So briefly, the way that that works is instead of computing convolution, kind of using the sum and the standard formula, what you're going to do is you're going to take an FFT of the input signal, an FFT of your convolution kernel, do a pointwise multiply, then take the inverse FFT. And this operation is exactly you're going to compute the convolution. Now, because the monarch exactly generalizes the FFT, the most uh, you know, obvious first step to take is just to take these FFT operations and replace the FFTs with monarch matrices. So of course we did this, uh, we, we gave it a try and our first results were a little bit funny. Uh, we, we started getting perplexity of 1.0. So if you're familiar with perplexity, perplexity is the exponent of the loss. So if you get a perplexity of 1.0, that means that we have a perfect model. Okay, so we're only halfway through the talk. Have we solved language modeling completely? The answer is no. So what was happening when you just do this naive replacement, you get a non-causal model. So you take a model, train it on next token prediction. When you do this, replace the FFT with monarch matrices, you can actually, the model will actually start to look up the answer. So it's not actually learning anything. It's just looking up what the next token is. So that brings us to a major technical challenge in using monarch matrices for a causal language model is that we need to make a causal map. So what that means is if you have some vector u, you map it to some vector h, you need hi to only depend on kind of u0 up to u1, uh, up to ui. So h0 can only depend on u0, h1 can only depend on u0 and u1, h2 can only depend on u0, u1, u2, etc. So the naive solution of what transformers do is you just mask out the future input. So to compute that first thing, you're going to compute it over a, a vector with a bunch of zeros. You're going to do it again for the next step. Uh, et cetera, to the end. So note that even if you can compute this kind of like the, this operation, this map in subquadratic time, because you have to compute at n times, you're still going to get quadra quadratic compute at the end of the day. So the key technical question is how do we efficiently make monoconvolutions causal? And our solution is instead of kind of masking out the input, we're going to make the operation itself causal. And I won't go into too many details because it's, uh, you know, it's quite mathematically involved, but I'll just kind of give a, a high level overview of what we do here. So what we do is we're actually going to take a polynomial view of this, of this operation. So this is a monarch matrix. Uh, this is an input vector. And basically, we're going to say, instead of looking at this vector as you know uh, a vector of some elements laid out in space, we're actually going to interpret it as a polynomial. And then basically, in order to create, uh, you know, find causal conditions, we just need to do a bunch of polynomial arithmetic to figure out what are the conditions that we can put on those original block diagonal matrices to get a causal map. So basically, uh, we have three theorems in our paper, and they take this polynomial view, um, do some arithmetic, and then at the end, you kind of get this causal map. If you do this, you can now replace the FFT operations with these monarch matrices. Uh, you get perplexities that start to make sense. So, so now we can actually, uh, you know, replace these models with something that is just monarch matrices. So that brings us to monarch mixer. So we've solved this technical challenge. We kind of know how to replace MLPs. Um, how do we actually do it? In monarch mixer, uh, where we're going to be doing having a lot of kind of architectures that kind of look like this. It's a family of architectures. We use monarch matrices to to do gated convolutions on the sequence mixing. We use block diagonal monarch MLPs on the dimension mixer. Um, I'm going to show you kind of uh, kind of go over a bunch of results here. I'm actually going to split it into two parts. So uh, we we talked a bit about the causal applications, but there's also a lot of non-causal applications out there. So BERT models, vision transformers, these are kind of a huge uh, use case for transformers. Um, and, and we're going to actually start with those non-causal applications and then move on to the causal applications with GPT style models. So we'll start with BERT, um, with M2 BERT. So uh, what we did here is we took kind of a BERT-based architecture, replaced the attention in MLPs with kind of monarch mixer primitives. And what we saw was that we could get a model that has 27% fewer parameters, kind of 27, at least 27% fewer training flops, um, and could actually outperform bait bursts by, by slight amount on downstream glue fine-tuning. When we scale up to BERT large, we, we see something similar. We can match quality on BERT with up to 27% fewer parameters for your flops. Um, and this is also full block sparse end-to-end -end training. So we don't even have to do the that kind of like two-step reverse sparsification, uh, sparsity, and then and then dense. 
This also translates to faster wall clock times, especially for longer sequences. So uh, even so, because attention scales quadratically, uh, as you get to, to, to longer sequences, uh, throughput goes down. Uh, with naive attention implementations, you also run out of memory. Even with flash attention, you still see a hit to throughput because, because of that fundamental quadratic compute. With M2 BERT, we can get up to nine times speed up over, over hugging face BERT um, at, at longer sequences. So up to 9x speed up over hugging face BERT at sequence length 4K. Of course, this goes up um, as you get to longer sequences. We've just now started to use uh, M2 BERT models for long sequence retrieval. So this is some new work that uh, isn't out yet, but hopefully we'll be releasing the model sometime, th uh, sometime this week um, if, if Simran and I can get our act together. Um, and we started to train some long context BERT models um, with M2 BERT. So, so far we've gone up to 8K. We have a 32K uh, retrieval model in the works. And basically what this allows you to do is you can now do long sequence retrieval um, much better than, than kind of, uh, you know, transformer based models. So we've started to put together a benchmark of just long context retrieval tasks. We're seeing some pretty big, you know, performance improvements over models that are have 15 times as many parameters. So if you scale in sequence length, you can get by with a lot smaller model. For non-causal models, we also see you know, positive signs in vision transformers, so we can match uh, vision transformer performance. Um, and we can actually help perform vision transformers, in fact, with up to half the flops, half the parameters. Um, for causal language modeling, um, we, we actually did something a little bit even more extreme. So what we did here uh, is we did a little bit more uh, mixing um, in the gated convolution, um, you know, a trick from, from an old paper on H3. Uh, and then we took out the MLPs completely. So we just left the, the dimension, we just left the projections in. No more MLPs, no kind of like big bottleneck. And we found that these models could actually match transformers and performance on the pile. Um, and that was pretty interesting. So uh, that's, you know, uh, quite intellectually interesting that you can take a model that looks so, you know, so different from a transformer and still match performance suggests that, you know, there's a lot of architectures out there, uh, you know, like Mamba that, that just released today that could match or outperform transformers. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the main result of the Monarch Mixer section. Let me briefly talk about some future directions that we're excited about. So first, uh, you know, getting to longer context BERT models, longer context retrieval. Um, you know, this is something that we're already working on. Hopefully we'll have something out this week. Um, certainly, hopefully before NeurIPS. You know, bringing this approach, this subquadratic in both dimensions to different models like T5 or diffusion models, you know, Sasha Rush uh, had some great work that was out, you know, late last week on uh, using SSMs for diffusion models, really excited to see uh, if we can make diffusion models, you know, even more efficient um, in, in various ways. Generally speaking, we're just very excited about efficient architectures. Um, you know, hopefully one day there will be many monarchs flying in the sun uh, and, and everything can scale much better than we have now. So in summary, to just summarize the Monarch Mixer portion of the talk, and then I'll briefly go on to Flash FFT Conf. Uh, Monarch Mixer is a new subquadratic hardware efficient architecture, uh, scales subquadratically in context length and model dimension, matches quality in BERT, vision transformers, uh, GPT with fewer flops, faster wall clock times. Um, and we're starting to train some long context retrieval models. So now let me move on to Flash FFT Calm. So here we're going to take the basic Monarch matrix and use it to speed up convolutions in general. So uh, to summarize again, uh, so for long convolutions in particular, you need to use the FFT to compute them in n log n time. But FFT algorithms are not very well optimized on modern GPUs. Um, so they have low hardware, low flop utilization. So what we do in Flash FFT Conv is we basically use a monarch decomposition of the FFT um, to, to map the FFT onto tensor cores, reduce the IO with kernel fusion, get seven up to eight times speed up, um, up to 62% flop util on to end, um, pretty close to flash attention v2. So we're get we're starting to get to the limits of, of what we can of what we can do here. So recall again the FFT convolution. Naively, a convolution is a quadratic operation, um, but you can compute it with the FFT. You take the FFT of the input signal, uh, multiply it with the, with the kernel and frequency space, and then take the inverse FFT. Point-wise multiply, inverse FFT. Okay, so this gives you an n log n algorithm. 
The challenge is that this algorithm, even though it scales better than attention, is naively often slower than attention on GPU. So our major question was, can we make the FFT convolution fast? Now, there's really two challenges um, to why the FFT convolution isn't naively fast on GPUs. One is that the FFT convolution is bottlenecked by the memory hierarchy. So every kind of operation, sorry, uh, every operation in that uh, in that previous slide uh, needs to communicate between HBM and registers. One standard solution to this is use kernel fusion. So instead of uh, kind of writing intermediate results onto HBM, you just keep them in SRAM. But that's ultimately going to be bottlenecked by SRAM size. So for sequences longer than 32k, uh, you actually can't fit um, you can't fit that into SRAM. The other problem is that the FFT can actually be compute bottleneck because it doesn't na naively use tensor cores. So recall that matrix matrix multiply is much faster on modern GPUs, um, but existing FFT algorithms, they were actually designed when CPUs were everything. So, you know, the, these algorithms were designed in the 20th century. We didn't have GPUs back then. So all their algorithms were designed to minimize flops, but they don't really naively use a matrix multiply operation because we didn't have fast tensor cores, fast matrix matrix multiply operations um, when we created those algorithms. Basically, the story that you're seeing is that as you see new, new use cases, new workloads, you're starting to see new bottlenecks, even in these really classical algorithms like the FFT. So what we're going to do, uh, as, as you can probably guess from this talk, is we're going to actually use the monarch decomposition of the FFT to break it down into a bunch of matrix multiply operations. So here we have those three steps. Uh, we're going to break up the uh, the first FFT operation into you know smaller FFT operations. The smaller FFT operations, you can actually just use tensor cores because you can just use the formulation of the FFT as a matrix matrix multiply operation. Then you do some pointwise operations uh, and then inverse FFT. So basically, we're going to use a matrix matrix multiply and the tensor cores in this first step. Um, of course, uh, one thing that I didn't talk about too much, but uh, the the monarch, you know, decomposition itself, uh, you can break up into um, more and more matrix matrix multiply operations. So, uh, the simplest way you can break it into two matrix matrix multiply operations you can also go higher order to to uh, like order three, order four decompositions. So basically, we're going to use the monarch decomposition to map the F15 onto matrix multiply. Uh, because uh, because we've mapped these into these smaller FFT operations, it also reduces what you need to keep into SRAM at the same uh, at any one time. So with this, we can also scale up to four million sequence length, so a lot longer than our thirty two k from before. Now, uh, there's actually quite an interesting trade off space here. So go check out our paper um, for uh, to to take a look at that trade off space and see as you get to longer sequences, you kind of need these higher order decompositions. I'll briefly go over some results uh, of us using Flash FFT Comp um, in, in a couple ways. So first is just you know raw speed up. We can speed up convolutions by up to almost eight times over PyTorch. Uh, significant memory savings because you can fuse operations. You don't have to keep things onto HBM over PyTorch. End to end, this results in up to four point four times speed up. Um, up to 62% flop utilization. So note that even though our flop utilization is not quite up there at flash attention v2, we can actually be faster than flash attention v2 at sequence lengths longer than 2K um, because, because there are just fewer flops in the convolution than in attention. Finally, flash FFT conv allows us to scale to longer sequence models. Um, so we've, uh, we're have we scaling language models up to 132K in sequence length, um, hopefully some models that we'll be releasing this week. Uh, high resolution imaging. So we have the first models that can solve path 512, which is a high resolution uh, imaging benchmark uh, with sequence length 262K. We are able to scale up DNA models up to 4 million base pairs, um, which is a really interesting kind of threshold because that's the at that length you can now start uh, you know, processing, embedding the longest human genes. So in summary for Flash FFT Comp, uh, we use the Monarch decomposition of the FFT to give us an efficient long convolution on GPUs um, by mapping the FFT onto tensor cores, reducing IO with kernel fusion, uh, results in significant speed up, um, flop utilization that is starting to, to match our most optimized transformers. 
And in summary, if we kind of take a step back and look at the talk in general, uh, if you only take, you know, kind of one thing away from this talk, um, the, the big takeaway is that uh, if we're just a little bit uh, smarter with the primitives we choose, we can be much, much more efficient. Um, we can get models that are much more efficient than our current architectures, our current formulas. Uh, so thanks so much for for listening today. Um, as a final uh, plug, you know these are all the great folks that I had a uh, I had the great great chance of working with on on all of this stuff. So you see Simran on here. Um, so she works on Monarch Mixer. Uh, Herman on here. Uh, he he was a major contribution to Flash FFT Conf. Um, as a final plug, I'm actually on the faculty market this year. Herman is on the PhD market. So if you're interested in this type of work, if you're interested in this stuff, um, you know you know definitely check us out. Um, there, there's a lot of interest, interesting work to do here. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it back to Simran. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's fun to be on the other side of the uh, of the, the screen this time. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Um, and I think if we can do it right, we will actually try to switch the audio as well. Okay, can you hear it? Great. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, one thing is your visuals are beautiful and the explanations are very Thanks. clear. So it's so a great talk. Um, and we have a bunch of questions that we've been um, crowdsourcing and so we can start today again. Um, sure. So one line of questions was around, you've done a lot of really interesting work on long context models and about like, you know, year and a half, two years ago, we didn't really have things that mm -hmm. could reach this, this um, context length. But now maybe um, one thought is like, it's a time to actually see how well we're using this context. And mm -hmm. we're seeing papers like from Nelson and Percy's group on like, um, you know, lost in the middle and the scrolls benchmark and so on. So what are your kind of high level thoughts on how we should be evaluating for the long context work? And do you anticipate that there'll be any major challenges when we start to just, you know, take the models we have and, and put them there. Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. I'm not sure if to, maybe I'll look at that camera. Yeah. Or, um, great question uh, from, from whoever it is out there. Um, so it's 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 really a, a, a great question that you ask. Or I can also look here. Um, and it's so exciting. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, it's really important that we create models that can actually um, you know, use the long context. Um, I think, you know, there's a great analysis that open AI's long context is maybe better than Anthropics or, or stuff like this. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of use real long context benchmarks. Um, personally, I'm really excited about kind of scientific applications where you have to, um, where it actually matters. There are like things that you wouldn't know if you, if you didn't have those, those long contexts. Um, things. There's also, you know, synthetics that that can come up. Um, so, so this was a major emphasis in the H3 work in in our work in Modern Mixer and some of your follow ups. Um, that if you kind of look at synthetics, you can play around and see exactly what can a model reason about over context or not. Um, Nelson's work was really great, showing that you kind of lose things in the middle. Um, and I think, you know, this long context retrieval benchmark that we're putting together looks at it. Um, I can see Neil out there who does a bunch of, you know, legal work. He has some, um, I think he, well, okay, well, Neil, if you're watching, uh, I'm going to tell everyone that you're going to pull out, <laughs> that you're going to put out a, uh, a, a long context legal benchmark. Um, but yeah, you know, there, there's really a lot of, you know, juicy applications out there, you know, putting together benchmarks, putting together things um, that, that really evaluate how well we can use these are, are I think, really important. So I guess following up on that, um, there's actually a question of like, what's an example of like long sequence retrieval that mm -hmm. you're dealing with? Um, I think depending on like how sort of speculative we want to be, like you can say, for example, like, oh, like OpenAI with GPT-3, right? They had like their embeddings models, like back in the text of Vinci three days or whatever, right? And so these things like presumably supported let's say like four theory or whatever, but they were worse than let's say extensions for a function one by well. And so like, there's a question of like, well, one, like, what are the actual tasks that you're thinking about in terms of like, long sequence retrieval and how are you going to evaluate, okay, like, these models can actually be useful here? But there's a slightly higher level, like, sort of meta question, which is, like, do we, how do you think, like, sort of M2 or, like, these other architectures will scale to actually being able to use these, like, capabilities, like, long context, I guess, right. capabilities. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, so to give you a sense of sort of the benchmarks that we've been putting, get, putting together, um, some of it is just kind of, uh, you know, taking the benchmarks that are out there where um, actually the documents really were very long and the things that you need um, are kind of scattered throughout. So, so one example is kind of summarization. So you might take a very long um, document uh, and then and then summarize it. And then the way that you look at that as retrieval is to say, you know, you have a bunch of summaries, a bunch of original documents, figure out which of those match. The really tricky thing is you want tasks where, you know, the answer is not immediately obvious. So one failure mode would be, you know, I have a screenplay, Star Wars episode four or something, and then it starts Star Wars episode four, yada, yada. And then the summary goes in Star Wars episode four, blah, blah, blah. And then in order to do that retrieval, all you need is kind of like the first sentence of both of the documents. So there are, you know, it's really important to kind of find these tasks where the, the, the answer is kind of, um, you know, distributed across it. So, um, you know, one synthetic we were thinking about is just uh, kind of a needle in a haystack type of thing where you have this long document and then there's some fact that you want to pick out from some part of it and seeing can you retrieve that. Um, so for the, so that, that's kind of a synthetic there. There's also, you know, um, if you want to, you know, and then there's, you know, the, the, these real applications, we have like kind of these summaries that, that we're looking at. Um, and there's, you know, a variety of things there. Um, I think we're really only really starting to, to scratch the surface. Um, you know, our first pass was look at the retrieval benchmarks people have and like figure out which ones have long documents in there at all. Um, and then kind of play around with them, figure out where are you actually getting that, that information? Um, so that's how we started to go about creating kind of these benchmarks. Um, and, you know, of course, talking to, to domain experts like Neil, sorry, Neil, he's just out there. If he ever sees this, he'll be, uh, uh, yeah, he'll be, yeah. Maybe you should come in, yeah. I guess so, like, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess, like, so there's a benchmark or a synthetic like, called, like, pass key retrieval, um, mm -hmm. where it's basically just, like, uh, I forget which paper originally had it, but it was sort of like, okay, there's like a password. And then it's like in a gibberish like amount of like text, like it's like the sky is blue, the grass is green, something is yellow, the pass key is right. blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, okay, like after that, it goes, you have a bunch of this and then the pass key is like hidden somewhere exactly. You said, you don't hit a stack. And then there's like a question at the end, like what is the pass key? And so mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, have you evaluated sort of like these like gated, I guess, long combo, like M2 style models on this? and yeah, like, I guess, I mean, just like, had you evaluated that and any sort of like positive signal so far? So this, this passkey thing sounds a lot like a synthetic that we've, you know, that we're all familiar with that um, you can read about in H3 and in unit papers a bit called associated recall, where you have like some keys and values and then at the end you have to look up some key. Um, this particular version that you kind of, you know, described is actually an even simpler one that comes out of kind of the induction head a line work out of Anthropic where you have like some magic key and then some like tokens afterwards. Uh, and then at the end of the document or wherever you have to kind of pull out um, the, the tokens that go to magic key. Um, so we've seen in kind of these synthetics that Monarch Mixer and, um, and you know, a lot of architectures like this can do it pretty decently well. I think we're, you know, maybe, maybe this week, um, maybe you guys are going to release some, some follow-ups kind of improving on it as well. Uh, you know, this stuff also made an appearance in Mamba, I think, today. Um, but yeah, so it's it's definitely, you know, top of mind for what we're looking at. Uh, I think uh, a really interesting thing is if you then take this and turn it into real text, um, how well that works. Um, and uh, I think, uh, no, I think I told, I think we told John to do it, but, but we'll see if, um, uh, how, how, how they're going. Maybe I can jump in with a question then. Well, I'm super happy to, you know, be back and the MLC Samaria series and ask a few questions myself. So that's, that's, that's super fun. Um, yeah. The question that I have is, so it seems that on, you know, um, relatively regular sequence benchmarks, uh, the performance is comparable, if not better. On uh, long sequence benchmarks, the performance is better because of, you know, can deal with a longer sequence. Um, my understanding is that the barrier of adoption was the fact that there was not an optimized kernel uh, with Flash uh, FFT com, it seems like now there's an optimized kernel. Is there any other barrier of, of, uh, of adoption? Is there like, will we see all the next uh, LLM models coming out be using uh, Monarch matrices? 
That's a great question. Um, I think so in the conversations that I've kind of had, um, there's there's folks who are you know really interested in trying out new things. Um, so some of these ideas are you know being used to train diffusion models. I think at Apple, um, you know at Together, which is you know very closely affiliated with the with the lab and with us, um, they're, they're using it. Uh, oh, I don't know if I can say that. Well, uh, maybe there's a <laughs> high likelihood that there will be a, a large model um, using the stuff coming out soon. Um, Monarch Mixer is being used to. There may or may not be a few companies that are using Monarch Mixer embedding soon <laughs> um, to, uh, uh, to, to do some of this long context retrieval. So I think there's people who are sort of, um, you know, playing around with things, very interested in things like that, who are I'm really interested in it. I think for, you know, the large companies, the open AIs, the anthropics of the world, um, they have a little bit of a innovator's dilemma where uh, it's actually quite risky for them to do anything that isn't the basic, super basic transformer architecture. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we, we've heard rumblings, you know, kind of in the background every now and then that they're looking into things like this. Um, but it may be the case that they do this and then they don't tell anybody because they're not open anymore. Or maybe they've already done it and then they, they won't tell anyone. Um, you know, famously, it took them, you know, some prodding to admit that they used flash attention, even though, uh, if you if you kind of knew the people working on the stuff, it was it was kind of obvious. Um, so there's, you know, when we see it in big models, maybe it's already happened and they haven't told us. Uh, maybe they're too scared of the risk. Um, there there's kind of you know a lot of um, a, a lot of other factors that go into play there. And of course, you know, I, I love that they're dumping money into it. You know, <laughs> uh, you know we. It's it's great that as a community we're trying out these, these different ideas. There are different people with different approaches. Um, right. I think that's you know a great way to to innovate and do science. Well, then we say if, if you if I read your answer correctly, uh, you don't think that there's any additional barrier of of, of adoption, right? If you think that all, all the pieces are there to be able to yeah. actually have you know whatever uh, llama tree if you want, right? That is yeah. that uses uh, that uses just uh, more yeah. practice makes sense and actually you know let me a follow-up uh question here and i think it's actually could be useful for uh the audience right it's um if i understand correctly also the you know um uh, flash of 50 com like flash attention part of the value comes from the fact that you were able to write the low level um cuda kernels to make that happen right to run it on the um uh, tensor course um i believe that many people think that that's kind of like a black card to make um, CUDA kernels um, that run fast on GPUs. Um, do you think that there's like a barrier of entry? Because I think other people could start to optimize this stuff by writing low-level kernels if it was a little bit easier. Or like, can you share resources with people? How to get started by, for doing that? How to learn about it? Um, what is your perspective on that? Or if there are tools that make it easy? Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think the compilers community is quite active here, so they're trying to make it easier for people to kind of enter. I will say, I think it's it does have a little bit of this like reputation of a black art. I don't think it's as black of an art as as it is. You know, uh, how, how, like two years ago, I knew nothing about CUDA. Like flash attention was literally the first time I touched it. Um, flash FFT com is you know my second CUDA project ever. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's not like um, it, it, it does take effort. It's not as easy as Python and stuff, um, but um, it is possible. I think, you know, Simran and, and Herman, who was sitting out there, but isn't anymore, um, they, they, you know, put together this great class with, with Azalea on some of this stuff. And you can actually get to kernels that are faster than PyTorch with like very few lines of code. I think you literally have it as a homework assignment to write a convolution that goes faster than that goes faster than PyTorch um, in some cases. So I think the the barrier to entry is maybe you know we don't really teach it very well in um, in courses right now. I think we should. There, there's people who are you know like Simran and Zayla who are like putting more effort into teaching it. Um, but the uh, you know there, there's so much low hanging fruit out there in terms of 
like research potential algorithms that won't make sense unless you have a little optimized kernel. And um, if you can kind of put in the effort, um, kind of grit your teeth and, and learn it, um, it's it's really great. Um, there's there's a ton of good resources out there. The documentation is actually pretty decent. Um, so there's like CUDA tutorials and things out there that you can take, but kind of it's it's one of those things that there aren't that many, you know, novel insights out there. Um, and the, the insights that there are like flash attention, flash, flash F and TCOM, these are really, you know, classical insights, you know, tiling is something that they teach you in like lecture two databases or something. Um, so like the, the ideas are, are classical, they're out there. Um, and if you kind of learn and take a crack at it, uh, I think there's a decent chance that that you can, you know, you'll, you'll hit new ground fairly, fairly quickly. That's great. Thank you for sharing. I think fundamentals are always the most important thing. I cannot stress it more. So I agree with that. We have a bunch of questions coming right, in, so go. we'll plunge through. I, I think so. One set of questions kind of merging some of uh, what I had written down and what Michael written down. So there's a lot of work on you know, subquadratic scaling and sequence length and relatively more analysis and papers there. But here with M2, there's also this aspect of subquadratic scaling and mm -hmm. dimension. Um, mm -hmm. And one sort of you know hypothesis, maybe not fully validated, is that we have a lot of like fact storage and memorization mm -hmm. um, that's being packed into the MLPs. And so like one question is around, you know, inductive bias here and like why we can still get good quality with sparse MLPs. I'm not sure if you wanted to ask, ask your uh, efficiency, efficiency line of work ones, but like, oh, yeah, um, yeah, we can, we can start with that. And, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the full knowledge right now is sort of that MLPs kind of store facts. Um, and uh, one question, of course, is like, uh, if you make these MLPs more sparse, are you going to lose some of those facts? I think my personal intuition, having no evidence for this, except just talking out of my ass, um, is that uh, MLPs are probably a pretty, pretty bad way to store facts. So learning facts with SGD from a corpus of random text documents, you know, if you were to ask somebody to do it, that's not the first thing they would try. Um, so I think, you know, I'm really excited to see, like, are there ways that, like, you know, we have ways of storing facts. They're called databases. Um, they're called knowledge graphs. Like, maybe uh, are there ways to, like, kind of use those um, instead of kind of learning it brute force by, by SGD? Um, I think our current models are probably way over parameterized for what they know and what they're able to do. Um, so kind of having smarter ways of storing those, those facts, I think you could see. I think there's, you know, a lot of fruitfulness there. Um, and like, like, like you said in your question, you know, this is uh, kind of compared to the amount of effort that's gone into long sequence, there's a lot less effort that's gone into kind of the MLP side of the world. So I think, you know, it's very um, green or blue sky, very green field. Um, and uh, I think it's also one of those cases where if you just start playing with it, you're, you're likely to find something interesting happen pretty quickly. Yeah, so I guess, I initially also was thinking about this along the lines of like, if you could just say more about why someone should care about, let's say, being subquadratic in, let's say, model dimension or hidden size. Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, like I guess mentioned, right? Like, I mean, perhaps catalyzed by like flash attention, right? Like we've seen like a ton of work that's like, oh, like let's be subquadratic in sequence like because this enables like new capabilities, uh, all context modeling or whatever. And less so at least in recent memory about like being, let's say, subquadratic in sort of model, maybe because like, Naively, like you're always quadratic and model with the MLP, like matrix mm -hmm. multiplications. And so, like, do you see, like, what are some like things that you point out are just like super core, like key advances enabled by like M2 by being, let's say, so quadratic in the right. hidden size? Yeah. yeah. I think um, one trend that you're seeing recently, and you know, that kind of goes against the narrative that I put on slide one of my talk is that models are actually not really getting larger. Um, they're actually getting smaller. So the models that people deploy, that they're training more, kind of 7 billion, 13 billion has kind of hit sort of this, this magic spot. And you're seeing people just train them a lot longer. Um, so practically, that's because we want models that can you know, run locally, run on, a, run on a laptop, run on a single GPU. Sort of scientifically, what that tells us is that you can pack a lot more facts into fewer parameters. Um, and so really that sort of tells us that there's this game to play where 
you have this black box MLP right now, that's one way of doing things. Maybe there is a much more efficient way to like store facts and store reasoning capabilities in those. Um, why you would care about subquadrating in particular? So the dream would be you can get something that kind of like scales as well as transformers in the width of the model, but with parameters that grow with like n to the three halves or n log n instead of n squared. Um, because that means hypothetically, and we, we certainly haven't shown that, like borne this out completely yet. Uh, that means that if you had a model that, uh, you know, was as deep and as wide as GPT-3 and could have the same performance on downstream tasks for everything that you care about, but where it has a lot fewer parameters because you're scaling subquadratically in the model width, um, like GPT-3 is eight times wider than, um, than GPT-2, but a hundred times larger. So if you take that eight times wider, keep the capabilities, and then only have it be eight times larger in, in parameter size. Now you're saying that's like a 40 billion parameter model that has the power of GPT-3. Of course, with longer training, larger data sets, we're starting to see this, um, but I think we should basically attack it from multiple angles, not just take model, take small model, train it longer, also take more efficient model, train it you know, with, with the best things. You know, I think as researchers, it's, it's really interesting to kind of take multiple attacks um, at this problem of efficiency. some more audience questions or should we wrap up? We take more audience okay. questions. Yeah. One or two more. So one interesting, yeah, yeah. So from the YouTube, one interesting one uh, from theater was, I wonder if model architectures could be optimized for context length ranges, like a transmission for a combustion engine and requests could be rooted to the right gear based on length. So basically <laughs> well, specializing different parts to handle different. Parts. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so a uh, lot of the questions from Fyodor. Um, you know, but before we answer that, I'll briefly share that when Deepak came on, um, Fyodor wanted to ask a trolling question about, hey, Deepak, last time you were here, you were uh, working for, um, where's he worked for? Previously, he was Microsoft. working for NVIDIA, or Microsoft, now he's working for NVIDIA, where, where are you going to work next? And I feel like this question about car transmission is actually the same. Um, so what I'll say is that uh, I think uh, you know, your, your question may be intended in jest, but I think there's a serious answer, um, which is that, uh, you know, there's this idea from, you know, a few years ago about things like model cascades or uh, using, or you kind of see it now with things like speculative de decoding, where you see smaller models get used first. Um, and then, um, and then if like kind of the question is sufficiently complicated, then only then do you go to, to the larger models. I think with context length, you could, you could see something similar. Um, with these M2 BERT retrieval models, I think we're actually going to suggest that people do this out of the box, where if you have documents that are only like 500 words long, like use a smaller model, like use the, use the smaller model that's trained on kind of smaller context. But if you have a document that's 8,000 characters or 30,000 characters, or not characters, words, um, then, then you can start specialized to, to larger models. Um, and I think, you know, a system that really takes these different, um, these different sequence lengths and kind of specializes them um, could be interesting. Uh, you know, uh, you can already imagine the Dolly 3 logo with, um, you know, Lewis Hamilton and his, you know, uh, Mercedes switching gears to, to longer context. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's definitely something like that that can happen. Awesome. Um, and one more question. So you talked about this you know, permute and transpose mm -hmm. um, set of operations in um, monarch, using monarch matrices. And one question that we got from the audience is, is it possible to force monarch matrices to be biased to local context and then weaken that restriction over time? Kind of maybe play with how the terms are interacting with each other. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is not something I had thought of. Uh, so the way that you would do it, so the way that we use them, we use the monarch matrices to basically uh, recreate convolutions. So the way you would do that is you would actually change the kernel. So I didn't talk about that a ton, but basically there's you know this K that you learn, um, and the way that you kind of bias it to shorter term interactions at first would be you just take that kernel and kind of shorten it, or sorry, you, you would set you know, the later values to zero or something very small. Um, and then as you train, you kind of expand it. Um, you know, there's great lines of work like S4 by, by Albert. Um, 
and things like that where, where you can basically parameterize that kernel in a different way um, so that you can train on one sequence length and naturally extrapolate to longer sequence lengths. Um, so there, there's, you know, a lot of work, you know, drawing on things like signal processing um, that you could do there. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that's certainly really interesting. Um, uh, not something I thought of from the Monarch Mixer point of view, but I think something that you would start with, um, with, uh, you know, with, with the kernel. So, um, sorry, I'm just laughing because Neil just walked by and gave me the same guy, uh, maybe for telling everyone what his winter break plans are. Nice. Well... <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think those are a bunch of the questions. We're also like pretty much over time. So yeah, if there's anything else you want to add, I know there's a lot of, like you said, Mamba came out, Retina, mm -hmm. RWKB, tons of cool models in this space. Yeah. Bigs from Sasha's Bigs, team. If you SSM, yeah. I don't actually know how to say that. So there's a new diffusion yeah. model that uses SSM. So I don't quite know how to pronounce, um, but yeah, I think does yes. one model rule them all or no, I so think, trade-offs? Yeah. Great question. I think many models will rule. We've seen, um, uh, you know, if you take the, the, the Star Wars point of view, the uh, Transformers have been the Darth Vader, the, the emperor of, of the space for a while. I think we're seeing lots of little rebel factions pop up um, and start to dethrone Transformers. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years they're... Um, they're relegated to the dustbin of what year is it? Twenty twenty one to twenty twenty three. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'm not going to put money down on it. I have no useful stock to put it onto that. It's part of that bet. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. This was a great talk, and um, everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us as well. Please uh, like and subscribe, and we'll see you soon after winter break um, to resume. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Michael is going to be running it next quarter. Cool. So uh, <laughs> say hi. <Yeah. laughs> if you have feedback on talk topics, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, let us know. Yeah, yeah. be fun time. Bye, YouTube. Bye. Thank you.